Hello to all fans of physics and physical experiments. This is Andrei Shchetnikov with you, and we continue our discussion uh, about jet engines and jet thrust. Today's video will be dedicated to the Laval nozzle. To put it simply, a Laval nozzle is a device that allows a gas flow to be accelerated to supersonic speeds. It consists of two parts, a converging section, the convergent, and a diverging section, the divergent. In the converging part, the gas accelerates up to the speed of sound, which it reaches right at the throat of the nozzle. After that, it continues to accelerate deep in the diverging section, reaching speeds higher and higher compared to the speed of sound. This nozzle was invented in 1890 by the Swedish engineer Gustav de Laval. He used it to accelerate steam in his steam turbine. Here you can see an illustration where the nozzles are aimed at, the blades of the steam turbine. And if you look closely, you can see the same converging and diverging design. The Laval nozzle found its widest application in jet engines, which is why we are discussing it in this series of videos. It is also used to accelerate gas to supersonic speeds in supersonic wind tunnels. Now let's briefly discuss the, the physical principles on which this nozzle operates. And I'll start with the principle of continuity. Suppose we have a fluid or gas flowing through a pipe with a variable cross section, and this flow is steady, meaning it does not change over time. In that case, the same mass of the medium must pass through any cross section per unit of time. This, this mass is equal to the product of the cross sectional area. And then you need to multiply by the O density and by the velocity. This value remains constant across all cross sections. Now, look, when the area decreases, the product RV must increase proportionally. Conversely, when the area increases, the product RV must decrease proportionally. And here, we can first take a look at what happens with a liquid. Well, liquids are almost incompressible, so we can neglect changes in density and assume that when the area decreases, in order for the same mass of liquid to pass through the narrow section, the velocity must increase proportionally. When the area increases, or the velocity accordingly decreases. But with gases, the situation is different. Now, the density of the gas can change significantly. So, when the passage narrows, the product of density and velocity must increase proportionally. And when it widens, the product of density and velocity must decrease proportionally. And it turns out that when a gas flows at speeds much lower than the speed of sound, it generally behaves almost like a liquid the change in density can be neglected. And accordingly, the gas velocity will increase when the passage narrows and decrease when it widens. But if the flow speeds are comparable to the speed of sound, or especially if they exceed it, the situation can change. Because it turns out that at such supersonic speeds, it is not so much the velocity that changes uh, significantly during narrowing and widening, but rather the density. And next comes a certain amount of mathematics, which, for obvious reasons, I don't want to write out. But the physics, nevertheless, needs to be specified. So, um, we've already written down the continuity equation. And also, what's important for us is the um, Bernoulli's equation, which says that the sum of the kinetic and potential energy for 
a given element of this moving medium is a constant value. Well, what is meant here by potential energy? Um, let me remind you. So, we, we push this mass element into a region of higher pressure. Work needs to be done for that. Accordingly, the kinetic energy decreases as it leaves the region of higher pressure. On the other hand, the kinetic energy increases. Well, besides Bernoulli's equation and the continuity equation, we also need to write down the adiabatic equation because we assume the process is adiabatic. This gas, or rather this gas element moving through the pipe, is moving so fast that during its uh, heating and cooling, it doesn't have time to exchange uh, heat with neighboring elements. Everything happens very quickly. So, accordingly, if we honestly write out all three of these equations, and it's better to write them in differential form, not just with constants, then we need to differentiate everything. And the constants will turn into zeros. Here, we need to expand the differentials. Again, I'm not going to do that here. Anyone who's interested can go ahead and do it themselves or read about it somewhere. In a book, it's not that difficult. So, when all three of these relationships are written in differential form, we eliminate pressure mo and density from them. That means, out of the four quantities we had, only two remain. Velocity and cross-sectional area. Oh, and the speed of sound also appears in the process. The speed of sound comes from here, from the adiabatic equation. Uh, it doesn't just fall from the sky, so to speak. And in the end, it turns out that everything comes together in this kind of relationship. Here I have dV divided by V, which is the relative increment of velocity. And here, dS over sub us, us, the relative change in area. And here, there's this bracket, V squared, divided by C squared minus 1. V is the velocity no, at this particular cross-section. No, and C is the speed of sound, again at this cross-section. Because generally speaking, the speed of sound here can uh, change from one cross-section to another. Primarily because the temperature are changes. During adiabatic compression, the, the gas heats up. During adiabatic expansion, the gas cools down. And as the temperature changes here, so does the speed of sound. So all of this is quite intricately interconnected. But we look at this equation and see the main point that at a given cross section is less than C, huh? then this bracket is negative. And that means when the area increases, the velocity decreases. When the area decreases, the velocity increases. But this is the case for subsonic flows. It, v is less than C. Everything behaves similarly to a liquid. Although, uh, as we approach the uh, the oh, speed of sound, uh, this factor here, uh, of course, is not exactly minus one. When the uh, the velocity equals the speed of sound, this is interesting. This term becomes zero. That is, no matter how the cross section changes, the flow velocity will not change locally at this uh, point. And when the flow velocity is greater than the speed of sound, this factor becomes positive. This means uh, that as the area increases, the velocity was also increases. So here, if we manage to push the flow through the speed of sound at this section, which is exactly what the Laval nozzle is designed for, then everything happens, well, in a sense, in reverse. Here, the cross-section was decreasing and the velocity was increasing. We reached the critical cross-section. If the local speed of sound is reached here, then you can, um, so to speak, jump to the other side of this equation. And after that, the cross-section will increase and the velocity will also increase. And this is the very principle, so to speak, that underlies the physics of the Laval nozzle but at the same time, there are still uh, a lot of other things to consider, right? Because in this equation, we forgot about density, we forgot about pressure. And as for temperature, we haven't mentioned it at all. Even though all of this is, of course, uh, 
important. Now we need to draw a general simple diagram. And in this picture, let's first look at the velocity touch graph, which is the blue graph. The velocity increases in the subsonic region, then rises sharply near the nozzle throat, and continues to increase in the diverging section. Now let's turn our attention to the green pressure graph and see how pressure is related to velocity. The velocity increases because the gas moves from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure. We can see that the pressure drops by many times. But we can also talk about this in terms of temperature. What causes the increase in velocity? It happens because the uh, internal energy of the gas, the thermal energy of the chaotic motion of molecules, is transferred into the energy of the translational motion of the entire mass as a whole. Accordingly, the temperature, uh, as a measure of this internal chaotic motion, must decrease, and that's the red graph. We can see that the temperature inside the Laval nozzle drops, the, both in the subsonic and supersonic regions. But there's still a missing graph here, the density graph. The density uh, also decreases, of course, from the inner part to the outer part. And the picture of the thermal motion of molecules allows us to understand and estimate the efficiency of the Laval nozzle. Look, we burned the fuel in the combustion chamber. The chemical energy was converted into the thermal energy of molecular motion. Now, in the converging section, we accelerate the combustion products to the speed of sound. The speed of sound is actually comparable to the speed of the thermal motion of molecules. This means that we've already extracted a significant portion of the energy. That is, we've converted the chaotic energy into the translational energy of the gas as a whole, but not all of it yet. And the expanding part of the Laval nozzle allows us to extract even more of this energy. Well, roughly speaking, you could say that uh, the exit velocity from the nozzle is about twice as high as the velocity at the narrowest point of the nozzle. Since it's twice as high, that means the thrust is also doubled in this way. The Laval nozzle allows you to increase the thrust of a jet engine compared to a converging nozzle by about a factor of two. And once again about engine thrust, but this time not in terms of carried away momentum, but in terms of reaction force. Well, this thrust is provided by pressure forces applied to the walls of the co combustion chamber. As we now know, about half of the thrust is generated by forces acting on the inner part of the combustion chamber, and the other half is provided by forces applied to the surface of the nozzle. And although the pressure here is not great compared to the pressure inside the chamber, the nozzle area is large, and these forces have a component that acts along the engine's axis. And doubling the thrust is not just a lot, it, it's a huge amount, especially in oh, a situation where you have to fight for every percent. That's why the question of how to most effectively position this surface is an important one. And people work on it. They calculate it. And now it's time for our final question. And to keep things interesting, I'll put it this way. Up to now, I haven't actually said anything about the fundamental difference between subsonic and supersonic flows. I mean, the speed of sound has only appeared as a coefficient in the equations and hasn't come up in its physical sense as the speed at which a signal propagates. And I want to ask, um, how can we explain the configuration of the Laval nozzle in terms of comparing the flow speed to the speed of sound? Share your thoughts on this in, in the comments to this video on YouTube. <laughs> Улетая в корабле, помаши рукой земле, ведь ты летишь на фирменной сабле.